afternoon. That got quiet so fast. <laughs> I'm Susan Hubbard, Dean of the College of Human Sciences, and it is my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to the Mildred Brown Davis College of Human Sciences Lectureship. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to get together, and we look forward to spending an hour together this afternoon. Before we begin, however, a little bit of housekeeping. You should have all received a ticket because we have a giveaway, so make sure everyone has a ticket. If you don't have a ticket, please raise your hand and someone will bring it to you, one to you. So we do have a few hands up, so if you guys will bring some tickets down, that would be great. So now, how exciting to wait to the end to see what our surprises are. Our guest speaker today is someone who has witnessed firsthand and reported on many historic world events, including the release of Nelson Mandela, the end of apartheid, the fall of communism in Europe, and 10 Olympic Games. Roger Thoreau's view of the world was wide and deep during his 30 years of reporting for the Wall Street Journal, 20 of those years as a foreign correspondent. While he wrote about the stories making headlines and described memorable scenes around the world, it was a little boy in need of food, a little boy in need of food, and the desperate look in the eyes of that little boy's father. It is that image that changed Roger Thoreau's life forever. Today, Roger is a scholar in residence for the College of Human Sciences, working closely with the Hunger Solutions Institute and the Office of Global Education. He serves as the, for the um, Chicago Council on Global Affairs as senior fellow for global agriculture and food policy. An author of three books, Enough, Why the World's Poorest Star in an Age of Plenty, another book, The Last Hunger Season, and then a third, The First 1,000 Days. All of these, of course, have hunger at the forefront and also help us realize our role in this fight. Today, Roger will focus on the pandemic and food insecurity, the ripple effect. He is joined on stage today by Ada Ruth Huntley, former SGA president and graduating senior in global studies with a minor in hunger studies. Ada Ruth will lead the conversation this afternoon, so please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dean Hubbard, for that lovely introduction, and thank you to all of you who have joined us this afternoon for what I imagine is going to be a really inspiring and engaging conversation regarding food insecurity with none other than Mr. Roger Thoreau. I remember as a freshman, um, or a sophomore actually, taking the Introduction to Hunger Studies class and reading these books. And you know, you get books assigned to read in class all the time, and you're like, ugh, just another thing I have to do in my busy schedule. But I remember reading these books in particular and being so moved and impacted by the stories that were shared um, and the impact that the things that Mr. Thoreau had seen had impacted him to continue on with this work. And so I'm really excited to engage in this conversation with somebody who's inspired a lot of my food insecurity work as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so we're here today to talk about the impact that COVID-19 has had on food insecurity. And you know, we already had such a wide ranging problem with this worldwide, but this has since been heightened as a result of the start of the pandemic. How much worse have things gotten? Yeah, I think the pandemic has, as you said, it's, it's heightened everything, it, it's exacerbated uh, everything. And particularly on the hunger and malnutrition front, um, we saw how swiftly and how rapidly and quickly this health crisis, this pandemic, how quickly and rapidly it became a, a food crisis a mal, a, a, and a crisis of nutrition. Uh, we certainly saw it in the United States with these epic long lines uh, suddenly of cars backing up at, at, at uh, you know, drive through food lines and bread lines, staggering. Uh, the long lines at, uh, at, at the food pantries, the, the empty shelves both in the food pantries and, our own sh and in our own stores. The, the farmers, because their markets had collapsed, uh, plowing under their, their crops because they had no market for them anymore. They didn't have any place to store them. New crops are coming in. The dairy farmers, but the cows are producing milk every day. We gotta move it. All of a sudden, those markets uh, dried up. So what do they do with that? So we saw these horrible scenes of, of, of spilling uh, milk. So I think it's made, particularly for, for, for us in the United States, have made hunger, that much more personal, mm -hmm. uh, more tangible, 
than at any time since the Great Depression, so nearly a century ago. Uh, and the hunger numbers have, have skyrocketed. Uh, it was horrible even before, um, uh, maybe before the pandemic of say 37 or so million, 37 million or so uh, Americans, so adults and children, uh, categorized as food insecure. Mm -hmm. um, various levels of that. Now it's, it's you know, up to 50 million uh, and above. And so we've really seen this escalation. That's in the United States. And then you can imagine how much it, it, what is done uh, overseas, and particularly in this country, then so impacted by the school closings. Mm -hmm. the, as the schools close, well, so do the, the, the breakfast and lunch programs. So that's the whole nutritional aspect, particularly for our children. And then you look at, at uh, abroad, uh, and it's the same impact there, only magnified sometimes just because of the poverty, the, the lack of access even more so to, to food, the lack of proximity uh, to the food, and so the impact that it's had on uh, uh, children, uh, adults overall, the World Food Program, you know, winning the Nobel Peace Prize in the middle of this for its heroic efforts, you know, in the midst of so many conflicts as well as the pandemic. Uh, to reach the, the, the increasing number of hungry uh, and malnutrition. So it's just exacerbated and skyrocketed uh, all these efforts that we're doing. And some people say it maybe has set it back our, our efforts and our progress maybe a decade or two uh, in this. So we just need to redouble uh, all our efforts just to recoup what we had and then to move, to move forward. Right, so this impact has been incredibly devastating and it's is definitely gonna impact this ripple effect that we've discussed in both malnutrition and food insecurity. And for those in the audience who might not be familiar with that concept of the, of the ripple effect, how would you define that? Yeah, so the ripple effect, again, that it's not uh, you know, what may have started off as a, as a pandemic, then we see you know, this, this ripple impact. So it's like, it's classic ripples as, as one's thinking about it. It's like you have a pebble or a stone and you throw it in a placid pond, it hits the water and all these ripples form. Uh, and where do they end up? They end up at your own, at your own feet uh, on the shore. So I think the ripple effects is that this is, it impacts everybody. So these ripples are there. So no longer can we look at the people in the, in the lines at the food pantries and the food banks and say, well, what did they do wrong? Why are they there? Now we understand through the ripple effect how it's impacted so many more, perhaps even ourselves, people in our families, people we know, our neighbors, people in our, in our, our faith institutions, uh, that uh, they're being impacted through no fault of their own. It's, it's jobs losses, it's uh, economy shutting down, it's a slowdown in the economy, kind of all these factors. It's school closing, children not getting the nutrition that they need. You know, so, so that all impact, and so those ripples then are, are everywhere and, mm -hmm. and profound. And then globally, and I think what we also see in this, that so these ripples, they're, they're all over the, uh, span the world, and so I think one of the profound lessons of this for everybody, but particularly for us Americans, is that there is no over there anymore. Right. Oh, this is a problem that's over there, uh, which we might have thought so as the pandemic happens, uh, wow, it'll be particularly bad over there. Uh, the, the hunger, the famine, that's something over there. But now it's here, it's, it's in our midst, we see it. It's always been here. We might have been shocked by these long lines that we're seeing, by, by this impact, by, by the action of our farmers, by what has happened to, to, to just going in the grocery store. My goodness, who would have imagined that we'd have all these empty shelves of all sorts of commodities, not just the food, but then the toilet paper, the, the paper towels, everything, the cleaning, the sanitizing things, all that. Like, what's going on? It's not a phenomenon that we're, we're not immune to any of that anymore. It's here. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not over there, so, these, the, so it's the ripples that, that, that spread everywhere. So kind of anything that you can touch to, there is an impact uh, from this. Absolutely, I think it was a lot easier pre-pandemic to have on your rose-colored glasses and be like, oh, it's a problem there. Right. But now we're definitely seeing it's a lot more of a problem here than I think we realize. And that has since been increased with the, with the arisal of the pandemic. Absolutely, um, and, and, and by doing that, excuse me, that, 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 that uh, okay. uh, it just came into my mind uh, that it's, you know, again, so we see these long lines, we're like shocked what's going on, but we shouldn't be, because what it's also done is it's kind of shattered this image of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. That we think, uh, you know, oh, in America the beautiful, it's, it's amber waves of grain from sea to shining sea. We feed the world, right, and we do. 
from the bounties of our, of, of our lands and our agriculture and our whole uh, uh, ag industry and the efforts. Um, but gee, we can't even feed our own fellow citizens, our neighbors. And it's not that we can't, but that we won't or that we don't. So hopefully this has us all thinking then, what are we as a country? Why do we tolerate this hunger? Mm -hmm. Not now, after, during the pandemic, but even before, if you think about that. We all think about, well, when's the new normal going to come? Hopefully, whenever that new normal comes and however it shapes up, that new normal does not include hunger and malnutrition anymore, anywhere in the world, let alone in the United States. And so, you know, this, this hungry Americans, I mean, what? It's this horrible oxymoron. Mm -hmm. These two words don't belong together, hunger and Americans. What right. they, they don't belong in the same phrase or the same sentence. Hungry Americans. So how do we move forward from this and say, whatever this world looks like post-pandemic, and hopefully it's soon that we'll be discovering that, uh, let's make sure there is no more hunger, malnutrition, food insecurity in our, in our country or anywhere. It's this medieval suffering, you know, when you think about it. Uh, what, lack of food? Lack of proper nutrition? Uh, yeah, we can't have that anymore. So that's one of the things. Uh, so yeah, sorry for interrupting, but I Again. figured that whole image of ourselves, our mythology that we built up amongst ourselves, shattered through all of this. And do not apologize for interrupting. This is a conversation. Um, so excited to be engaging with you today. But you know, you've seen this firsthand, and you were actually nominated for a Putlitzer Prize with you and your colleague for your work in this area. Is are, is that kind of collection of experience what's drawing your conclusion about the ripple effect? Uh, it has, yes. And thank you for that. Uh, when thanks for all the mentions of the of the three books. Uh, <laughs> so I just signed them for Ada Ruth. She's been carrying these all the all, all this time. Uh, they're nicely dog-eared. So hooray for that. <laughs> they're not like nicely new. Sometimes you see that and you figure, oh, okay. So they bought it and it's sitting on their shelf right. somewhere. But <laughs> these have been used, and I'm sure notated and annotated inside as well. So Absolutely. thank you for that. So I call these three books the Real Hunger Games trilogy. Uh, they, they are not some dystopian society in that other Hunger Games uh, trilogy. I'm waiting for someone to start making movies uh, <laughs> about these. Even little short videos would be okay, right? There you go. Uh, the, uh, but the real Hunger Games, it is, it, it's, it's not a dystopian world. Again, as we've been talking about and with the Ripple effect, it's here, it's in, our, it's in our world that we brought hunger and malnutrition with us into the 21st century, into this grand new millennium that we have, and here we are. 21 years into this new century. Mm -hmm. And wow, it's getting even worse you know, with the pandemic. Uh, and so each of those books then at the core, there's a core outrage, but then also inspiration. That doesn't have to be this way. We know what to do. Hunger's not, you know, so during the pandemic, we're waiting, we're praying for, for people in lab coats, scientists, great minds, please come up with a cure. Please develop a vaccine for this. Ending hunger and malnutrition, we're not depending on someone in a, in a, in a, in a lab coat. Or, yes, scientists, you know, please contribute the, on, 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 on the seeds and the plants and, and, and all your great knowledge on agriculture, producing more nutritious food. But we know what to do uh, on this front. And so all of this that I was seeing in, in my writing for the Wall Street Journal, particularly overseas with the journal, to see that and then start asking why, how, in heaven's name, have we brought this medieval suffering with us into the 21st century? So Dean mentioned in her opening remarks, and thank you for them, this little boy uh, in Ethiopia. Kim, if we can. The little boy is this guy, Hargirso, in the front. His father, who was also mentioned, Tesfaya, in the back, holding him, propping up his son, this was in 2003 in Ethiopia. It was the first great hunger crisis, the first famine of the 21st century. There were 14 million Ethiopians, 14 million, one four million, that were on the verge of starvation, surviving, if they were going to survive at all, by, by kind of the food aid that was rushing in from, the, from, from the, 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 the rest of the world. With the United States leading the way in the World Food Program, 
kind of on the front lines of distributing that. And many, many you know, American household name uh, NGOs uh, that were then distributing this. And so this massive effort, 14 million on the doorstep of, of starvation. And I was based in Zurich in Switzerland at the time for the Wall Street Journal, not writing about you know, banks or, or the, the international flow of, of capital. Uh, but writing about humanitarian and development uh, efforts. Uh, Switzerland, Geneva, the second headquarters, basically, the UN, so many of these humanitarian organizations based there, was talking to them constantly uh, about this. So went to uh, Ethiopia to see what was happening and, and, and write about this. Well, what famine and, 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 and this medieval suffering again still with us, three years into this new millennium. With all these scientific advancements of the past, of the, of, the, of the previous decades and centuries, and all this telecommunications ability and technology and capabilities, literally at our fingertips, right? We can communicate with anybody in the world. Uh, the shrinking of the world, we're all neighbors. Um, what? We still have this profound deprivation of hunger uh, and malnutrition. So went to Ethiopia to see what was going on. Uh, first day there, meeting with the World Food Program in their office in Addis Ababa, the capital of, of Ethiopia. And I can still remember clearly, so it was a big data, it was in their conference room of their office, a big conference table. They had a map of Ethiopia kind of sprawled out and then they unfurled a map of Africa because it, was only, it wasn't only in Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa, but it was stretching down all of East Africa into Southern Africa. The AIDS epidemic that was exploding, uh, you know, causing a new variant, famine and hunger. Normally it would be crops that fail for whatever reason. In this new variant famine, AIDS-driven family, famine, it was the farmers who were dying. They didn't even have the opportunity to plant the crops because they were either too, will, too ill, they were weak, they were dead, their kids, the child-headed households, they had no experience what, what, when to plant, where do we get the seeds, what do we do? So this day, the, the, the WFP then finding all sorts of new uh, areas of, of, of hunger and malnutrition, and they had to then okay, well, how do we distribute to them and include them in all our surveys of, of who the hungry are? So all this was on their maps of where, where hunger is not only in Ethiopia, but throughout Africa. And the next days I would be then traveling with them to some of the hunger zones in Ethiopia. So that's what we were looking at, the map of Ethiopia. And then one of their workers uh, who would be traveling with us, he said to me, it was, a, it was, it was meant from him as, as a kind of a piece of advice, but to me it sounded like a pretty ominous warning. And he said, Roger, Look into the eyes of someone dying of hunger mm. becomes a disease of the soul. For what you see is that nobody said to be dying of hunger. See, particularly not now, in 2003, three years into this grand new millennium of ours. And I'm like, disease of the soul? What's, the, what's this guy talking about, right? Disease of the soul. What do I do about that, right? Uh, you're always worried about you know, some kind of physical ailment. So you got your, your yellow fever shot, uh, you're, you're taking a malaria. Uh, medication, you're kind of on the lookout and, and, and aware of are there any cholera epidemics, Ethiopia's in the, uh, uh, some of the other um, uh, kind of belts of, of, of various diseases. It's like anything happening there, uh, but a disease of the soul, what's that? So a couple days later, then we were, we were driving down south of Addis, uh, and then eventually we're kind of going up a dirt road onto a plateau, the Marisha Plateau, kind of driving down a dirt road, come to a market area. And normally that's where farmers would, 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 would carry their, their surplus crops and, and a market there and they would sell their crops. This year, in that year in 2003, there was nobody selling crops because there were drought, there were other factors that were going on. Nobody had crops to sell. But instead, there was this vast warren of emergency feeding tents that, could be, that, that were set up. So if you imagine kind of these big army tents uh, that were set up, uh, dozens, a whole wave of, of, of doctors and nurses and emergency relief workers that were there from around the world. And we kind of parted the flaps of one of the tents and stepped inside. And it was this, this, this scene of, of kind of utter horror 
because in each of the tents there were dozens upon dozens of, of children that were, were, were on the doorstep of starvation. Some were being fed, you know, intravenously, in, in, intravenously through, through uh, you know, nose tubes uh, and, and, and intravenous feeding with the, with the drips and things, and it was, it was awful. I was like speechless, I, what, what, how do you even react to this? So I kind of walked to the back of the tent, kind of trying to, to gather my thoughts as I went back kind of passed all these children with their, with, with their parents, one parent, two parents, uh, brothers and sisters maybe running around outside, and got to the back of the tent, and there was Hargirso and Tesfaya. And so I stopped, those were the first eyes of the starving that I looked into. I was ashamed of myself, because I'd been a foreign correspondent already for a number of years, uh, had, been, had been based in South Africa at the time of Nelson Mandela's release and the end of apartheid, had written about hunger as kind of a backdrop of, of Africa, so in other stories, economic stories, social stories in Africa, but never focusing so much on hunger itself and the hungry. So there I was for the first time looking into the eyes of the hungry, and I'm like, why, why hadn't I done this before? How, how had I missed this? So those then become the first eyes. Hargirso, as we see, he's about five years old at the time, and he weighed just 27 pounds as his father carried him there from from their farm. And his dad was a smallholder farmer. You can see how thin he is. I mean, his, his, his ribs, his collarbones are protruding. He's so thin, and he's holding up hard gear so because otherwise he would, he would you know, topple over. Uh, and you can see the, 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 the manifest malnutrition with the swollen face, so the protein deficiency, the arms and the legs, you know, spindly but also swollen um, uh, in a sense. And Alicia's here, she can give us a primer on, on, on various forms of, of malnutrition. Uh, and so, so, so manifestly malnourished, and when we, we were, then, then the, the doctors came over, and the nurses as they were making the rounds, and Hargirso, they, they had started him on emergency feeding regimen and therapeutic feeding. They said he's recovering some, but the shock was so severe, they were telling Tesfaya, his dad, we don't know if he's going to survive. As a foreign correspondent, normally I would like leave the tent, write my story, and then, oh, where next? What's the next story? What, where, where else am I going? Either in Ethiopia, or where's the next country to go to? Moving from place to place, story to story. This is the story that stopped me cold. I knew I just couldn't leave the tent that day and move on. This is the story I needed to keep coming back to and back to and back to. Not just Ethiopia in 2003, but the over, the grander, the larger story of hunger and malnutrition in the 21st century, and what's wrong with us, that we've, we've allowed this, that we perpetuate this, not only, not only there, over there, but then also in our, in our, in our own country, then as my reporting uh, continues. And then, so the, the, just to explain the ripple effect uh, of this and kind of how the reporting continues, so it kept in my back of my mind. So it becomes this disease of my soul. Whatever happened to Hargirso? Did he survive? So it was five years later that I was back in, in Ethiopia. I was going to go back to Ethiopia. So I got a hold of the World Food Program. I said, hey, are you still uh, in contact uh, with them? And they said, oh, yeah. Uh, we're still active in that area. Let's see if we can contact him. So they got back to me. Yes, we found Tesfaya. He's still there. I said, great. I'll be on my way. Uh, and so there we were, back up the Corkscrew Road, you know, on the dirt road, to Tespaya's house, uh, and, and little, little tiny hut that he has this smallholder farmer. And, you know, Tespaya sees me and comes running across the street with a little dirt road, and he's got like a machete in his hand, and so he's waving that, and I said, oh Lord, you know, what's this all about? Uh, and then he comes and he embraces me, uh, still with the machete uh, in his hand, so phew. Uh, and then a little boy comes running across the pathway, the dirt road. I said, how's, how's Hargirso? And he said, this is Hargirso. So do we have the next photo? So this is five years later. Oh, oh this is then later. That's okay. He was 10 years old at that stage, and he only came up to uh, my belt. Wasn't in school. Dad figured he didn't have uh, you know, the capacity to study. So then five years later, I'm back in the area again. I figure, okay, I'll see how Hargirso is. Now he's about 15 years old, 
and he's in school. Well, hooray. So we go down the pathway to the school, and he's in first grade. 15 years old, first grade. You can see the impact of the stunting. So these ripple effects. Stunting is a measurement of children under five, too short for their height. That's the clinical definition, the scientific, the medical definition. But that doesn't do justice to what stunting really is. It's a life sentence of underachievement and underperformance for these children. And so here's our gear so. Now he's about up to my rib cage at 15 years old, the bottom of my ribs. And he's, he's in school, hooray, but he's in first grade, just learning his alphabet. Then I go back again, next picture. December 2019, last trip that I make abroad before the, before the pandemic hits. He's 21 years old now, he's an adult. So there he is next to Tesfaya. He's grown some, so the physical stunting, he's overcome a little bit, but you can just see him kind of in his legs, uh, you know, in kind of the way he moves and things. Okay, there's still a physical uh, impact of that. How's school? Are you still in school? What are you doing now? I'm still in school. Okay, well, that's great. Figured out he's off to high school or something. So we go to the school, it's the same school. Next picture. Fourth grade. Six years later, he's advanced only three grades. He's in the fourth grade at 21 years old. Imagine that, 21 years old, the fourth grade. As in the other photo, you can see he looks like the other kids in the class. Back then, he was 15, and the other ones were seven or eight years old, nine years old in first grade. This time, you could see some of the kids, this guy in the red and the yellow, he's probably a normal fourth grade age uh, for Ethiopia. Uh, half of that classroom, 60 plus students, were 18 years old and above. That's this ripple effect from that severe hunger crisis in 2003, here we are 16 years later, and the children at that time, the young children, even those that were in the womb at the time, and their moms were malnourished because of the famine and the hunger crisis, this is the ripple effect all these years later. This whole cadre of children, young children from back then, so severely stunted, some physically, but almost all of them cognitively. That's this tremendous cost for all of us in the world. And so that, if you then, so when I was there in December, it was like, okay, the pandemic just started and hearing about it, but not exploding as much. So to me, this classroom was a look backwards. Oh, back in time. Here's the impact of, of something that happened 16 years earlier, what we see now. Then the pandemic starts spreading, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. That classroom is a look into the future. Not just back, but into the future. What is the impact on the babies today, of 2020, of 2021? Those that are just born? Those that are still in the womb and the, and the mother is so impacted by, by the nutrition crisis of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Maybe their moms are breastfeeding, so they're not getting proper nutrition from that. They're starting complementary feeding. It's not there, the enough food and the nutrients that they need. They're in school, they're young children. The school feeding programs have been shut. There's no schools. What are they getting? So what is the impact of that? So 15 years from now, what are we gonna see in the schools then, both in our own country and in all these lands all over the world? Because I think that the, 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 the true ripple effect, the long-term ripple effect of the pandemic will be, hopefully not, but we'll see, is that the long-term impact of the pandemic will be carried by the nutrition and the malnutrition uh, going forward. And so that's this ultimate ripple effect uh, that we'll see. So a long discourse, uh, sorry for that, but uh, those are the eyes uh, then that I looked into that inform my journalism uh, and have brought me to you today uh, to be a scholar in residence here uh, that have left, brought me to leave the Wall Street Journal and write these books in long, long form narrative journalism uh, because that disease of the soul, soul still, still propels me. Uh, so I tell everybody, you know, Alicia knows this well, don't get me started uh, on this because the <laughs> class will soon be over. And it's like, well, what do, what do we talk about today? Well, uh, this, so. Well, please don't apologize. I know reading that story in the books was moving, but then 
hearing it in real time is just even more impactful. So thank you for sharing that. And you talk about this disease of the soul, and I hope y'all don't mind if I share a brief story. I had the opportunity to study abroad in India, as we've previously discussed, and it was the same semester I took Intro to Hunger and had just read the first 1,000 days. So I had gotten a glimpse of what hunger in India looks like. And you know, it's so easy, again, those rose-colored glasses to go, oh, it's a their problem. But then I went, and I saw it with my own eyes. And the thing that, I mean, still like keeps me up at night to this day, we had been heckled by people all throughout the trip because you know, if you're in India, people know that you've, you have the finances to travel there. Um, so we had experienced it from adults and other children. But at the time, um, for those of you that don't know, I have a, a surprise six-year-old brother. Um, he was born when I was 15 years old, and uh, he would have been like four or five or maybe even three at the time. There was a little boy who came up to us. We are in Jaipur. We are getting on the bus. He came up to us. He didn't even come up to my waist. Um, didn't know really any English, but knew enough to say food. And man, that just impacted me. Because he looked the size of my little brother. But knowing what I knew in the book, he was probably nine, 10 years old. I mean, he was just dirty, had these lesions on his body. I mean, it was, it was horrible. I got on the bus and I just sobbed. I just sobbed all the way back to our hotel. And I thought about the things that I would learned in the book and saw so many of that and those concepts transpire during my time in India. So, I mean, the timing was just kismet that I ended up reading it the same semester that I traveled. But that disease of the soul can really impact you. Um, and I know it's impacted so many people in this class as well, because a lot of people that are here have done a lot of work for food insecurity. But a lot of us don't have the opportunity to go to Ethiopia, and we don't have the opportunity to go to India and see these things firsthand. So what does that ripple effect look like in the US, and how can we be a part of intercepting that before things get worse than they need to. Yeah, so Ed, thank you for that, for that story. Very poignant and, and moving. You know what I said when you told me that story? I said, you're the one, right? <laughs> I said, I'm the one. I said, you're the one. Because when Scott and I first wrote the, the first book, Enough, we were both at the Wall Street Journal. So it was the largest paper in the United States at the time. Uh, circulation of two million, readership of six million a day. And we're like, we're going to write this book. Well, how many people are actually, actually going to read this book? And I said, well, realistically, if we're honest with ourselves, it's like on hunger, and a lot of it is in Africa, so it is in all likelihood probably not going to be a bestseller. It wasn't. Uh, <laughs> in certain categories, I mean, yeah, if you want to slice them really thin. Uh, uh, but uh, I said to Scott, look, Scott and I agreed that if only one person reads the book and sees this disease of the soul or catches this disease of the soul or goes off and does things like you were doing, and congratulations on all your work at the student government, Thank you. and particularly in raising the awareness and the issue of hunger on campus uh, and Auburn uh, and all college campuses uh, and in the United States. So congratulations on that and well done. So that's, that's the one. You're the, you're the one that we wrote the book for. So it makes all of this you know, worthwhile. Uh, so you guys are all the one, uh, and so this is, it's, 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 it's trust, and, and you're right that you see something, and we heard this from, from, from Lauren Bush Lauren as well, that you see something, mm -hmm. and it's there, you can't, you can't forget about it. It, it, it moves you, it motivates you, it fuels your passion, which is a great thing, and it can be anything, it doesn't have to be on hunger, it can be kind of on anything that you see, you say, that's what I want to do, I want to do something that works on that, and, and we get to this problem. Uh, or to the bottom of it, or eliminate uh, this problem. And so it doesn't need to be in Ethiopia mm -hmm. or India. It can be or over there. It's here. So anything that's in your communities, you know, the people sitting next to you, in your, in your hometowns, on campus here, so what, what is it? Is 25%? Yes, is that it? Uh, uh, food insecurity. Uh, here at Auburn. Um, and nutritional uh, issues, and it's the same at, at basically all you know, college campuses. You say, what? These are, the, these are the universities where the best and brightest in our country are going to. What? There's a problem there. It's in all our neighborhoods, uh, anywhere that you look in the United States. Uh, one thing that in looking into this, one of the ripple effects, I mean, just in terms of numbers, uh, Feeding America, uh, that kind of runs a nationwide network of food banks, they work with the... Uh, uh, kind of whatever number of pantries that they're working with. The number that they work with, and I was thinking, what's the scale of, of this or numbers by comparison? 
there are, there are like four or five times, a magnitude of four or five times as many food pantries that our nationwide network of food banks work with more than the number of McDonald's restaurants in the country. The golden arches are everywhere. They seem ubiquitous. What? They're all over the place. How often do we see the pantries uh, unless we look? And now we see them. And so go into those pantries. The work that you do here, particularly on hunger and malnutrition, in your own communities, and what you tell your family, your neighbors, uh, just anybody you're interacting with, your classmates, that becomes this, this effort that we're talking about, uh, this, this disease of the soul. So in your studies, if this, if this gets into your soul and fires up your passion, you know, God bless you, because that's something really special that will then motivate you uh, on this front. Absolutely, and you said a really key thing earlier that I just clung to. You talked about that core outrage that you felt by the things that you saw. And you know, I had that disease of the soul in India, but I think I had that core outrage on campus when I had another experience that me and you previously discussed. I had the opportunity to serve as a student volunteer with the campus food pantry. And you know, normally it's like names I don't know. It's just you know, passing off another paper, stuffing another bag. And I remember one day in particular, I got the sheets, I flipped open the folder, and I saw the name of somebody that I knew. And this is somebody I'd interacted with in student involvement, and like I'd seen like come and go from around campus. I had no idea that they were struggling with food insecurity to the point that they felt that they needed assistance. And it just wrecked me, and I felt so angry. I'm like, why aren't people seeing the magnitude of this issue, you know? And I wanna talk about a positive ripple effect, right? That yes. you've had on me and your work has had on so many of us sitting in the room, but it can be very intimidating to feel like you're the only one that cares about the problem, you're the only one trying to solve the problem. Um, and you talked about a great, great proverb that I would hope that you would share with us today. Um, but how can we kind of move past those times of doubt when we have that core outrage to step up and make a difference in kind of our own different fields? Yeah, it will, thank you. Thank you for all these stories and the experiences that you've had and going forth and acting on them uh, and sharing them with everybody. That's, that's terrific and tremendous. Uh, and yeah, I, I kind of have those similar uh, doubts and you know, wonders and plenty of people, including fellow journalists. Uh, you know, they'll say, gee, Roger, so you keep writing about this. Uh, you know, is it getting any better? I mean, like, gee, don't you get depressed? Why do you write about this? And, you know, it was the, one of my editors at the Wall Street Journal, they were very good in running, running these stories as I was writing them and writing them. Again, my disease of the soul, they'd say, kind of what's new or, or next story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'd propose another story on hunger, some, some, some on hunger and, and, and nutrition or malnutrition. And so one of my editors would say, hey, oh, Roger, so, yeah, thanks for your proposal. What's, uh, uh, haven't we like written about this before? What's new? And I said, what's new? You're right. What's new is that it's old and that it is an old story and it still abides. And we have to keep writing about it and writing about it because otherwise this old story we take for granted and it's always there. But it's always new. It should always be fresh. Hunger in America? My goodness. What's happening? Why do we tolerate this? So along with the outrage, always should come and inspire. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of one-two punch. So my mantra as a journalist, outrage and inspire. And so this inspire, which then also comes from, from, from your work and you're the embodiment of this, uh, reminds me so much of this African parable. Uh, the hummingbird and the wildfire uh, told often, uh, and you can, you can you know, Google it, uh, uh, it's narrated by, in one of the versions, by Watari, uh, Mangari Matai who was a Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner from Kenya as an environmentalist, just planted trees all over the place in Kenya and got everybody talking about this, thinking about these things. And the story that she would tell is, so the hummingbird and the wildfire, is the savannah's on fire and this huge conflagration. And all the animals are like scurrying and fleeing. And they get to kind of the edge of where the fire is and it seems to be under control. So they're standing on the edge, the giant elephants and giraffes and all the animals. And all of a sudden they notice this hummingbird, this tiny little hummingbird that's just fluttering back and forth. And they watch it and it goes to a river, dips its beak in the river, gets a couple of drops of water, goes back over the wildfire, drops a couple of, of, of drops on the fire, flies back and keeps shuttling back and forth. 
And kind of the elephants are looking at that and scoffing, and they've got their big trunks that can fill up with gallons and gallons and hundreds of gallons of water. And they're kind of just standing there looking at it and saying, oh, what can we do? They said, hummingbird, what are you doing? This is foolish. You're so small, you're going back and forth. You just have a couple of drops and you're putting on the fire. Well, you're not going to put out the fire. And the hummingbird says, maybe I can't put out the whole fire, but I have a couple of drops that I can put out a couple of flames. I'm doing what I can. That's the whole notion of this. We do what we can. It's the whole aspect. It, it, it's the embodiment, this whole story of, of, of uh, the hummingbird uh, is we do what, what we can. We do what's in front of us. It's the embodiment of the college of human sciences. It's improving the state of the world. It's what the Hunger Solutions Institute is about. The Hunger Studies and the Hunger Studies Minor. It's what can we do about it? We all have a role to play. So when we look at the issue of and the problem of hunger and malnutrition, God, it, it looks like this great conflagration, this wire wildfire that's out there, particularly now in the pandemic and the ripple effects. Boy, this stone, these ripples are in the pond, the ripples are going all over the place. They're engulfing us even here in the United States. Wow, that's a big problem. What can we do about that? It's so big, oh, surely we can't do anything about it. But we can. Mm -hmm. You do what's in front of us. So that's kind of my charge to everybody, uh, is do what you can. And this, and then ending hunger is something, and malnutrition and doing our part on it is something that we all can do something about. No matter what you're studying, what your skill set is, what your career may end up being, what your passion is, and you may be saying passion, yeah, Lauren Bush was talking about that too, uh, and I don't know what my passion is, I'm struggling to find my passion. It'll come at some stage, and when it's there and you find it, act on it and do what you can, whether it's on the hunger issue or, or poverty or any social issues or anything that moves you, do that and follow that and do what's in front of you and do what you can. So we can all be the, we can all be the hummingbirds, right, in this, in, 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 in this college. Uh, and, uh, and, and Ada Ruth, Ruth, you're a great example of that. So thank you for being a hummingbird and doing what you can and all, all you guys uh, as well. Well, thank you for certainly inspiring and being a large part of inspiring me to be a hummingbird and so many people in this audience because just looking at some faces, we have some rock stars doing incredible things Absolutely. to help in food insecurity. So I'm definitely one of many in the College of Human Sciences, but thank you for all that you do. Um, and that pretty much wraps up our conversation. So can y'all join me in thanking Mr. Thoreau for being with us this afternoon? <laughs> and thank you, Ada Ruth. <laughs> And thanks for having me here as a scholar in, as a scholar in residence. Uh, you know, I, I told the story, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, to you all, uh, but when I was growing up, and every day that my brother and I, when we would leave our house in Crystal Lake, Illinois, my mom would always say, study hard, you might be a professor someday. So my brother <laughs> did indeed become a professor in, in uh, rain sciences and kind of wildlife uh, uh, conservation and environmentalism at Texas A&M and, 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 and Wyoming, University of Wyoming. Uh, and so I feel I'm that much closer to it now. At least I'm a scholar. I'm a scholar in residence uh, here. Uh, so this is a great thing. So if nothing else, I have uh, fulfilled the wishes and prophecy of my mom that if you study hard enough, someday you will be a professor. So, <laughs> so thank you for bringing me here. Of course. Thank you for being here and engaging with our classes. I know I've gotten so much out of like getting to learn from you um, in person and in real time. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for letting me engage in this conversation. Conversation. Thank you for being here and thank you to everybody in the human sciences for all that you do because you've inspired me to be the hummingbird that I am. So I really appreciate all of you. <laughs> and we can't wait to see what else our hummingbirds will do in the College of Human <laughs> Sciences. So how fun is that? It's startling to hear though how serious hunger is around the world but also right here on our own back doorstep. The Hunger Solutions Institute, you've heard that term several times today, and the managing director of HSI is Alicia Powers. You've heard that name a few times. So Alicia's here with us today, and um, this is housed, of course, in the College of Human Sciences. If you'd like to learn more about that, we have information on the table outside the door. Please stop and find out more and how you can get involved. And also while you're there, also to find out more about the amazing world-changing programs in the College of Human Sciences. So you can find some information on the table about that as well. 
and our very own scholar in residence, I'll say it as many times as I can while you're here. Thank you. Um, Roger Thoreau will be outside also to sign your, your books as you leave. But Ada Ruth, we thank you for all you have done during your tenure at Auburn for the College of Human Sciences and Auburn University. And when you, we wish you very well in these next amazing steps you're about to take thank in the you. next part of your career path. So congratulations to you. Thank you very much. And thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. What an inspiring afternoon we've had. Now we all need to just run out and change the world, right? <laughs> yes. So we will do that. And thank you so much for your time. And good afternoon. Thank you.